morning and welcome to the Lake Sunapee United Methodist Church. I'm Pat Trader, the lead worship musician. I'd like to bring us into the mood of worship with um, two songs, both found in the Red Celebration Hymnal, starting at 219 with Surely the Presence of the Lord is in this place. And then we will go right into the next hymn, 220, He is Here.
response of prayer. Let us be in the spirit of prayer. Let us pray for the spirit of wisdom to rest upon us, a spirit of understanding and knowledge. Grant us to live in harmony. God's mercy prevail. Let us pray for God's steadfastness to gird our spirit. May peace prevail like lamb and wolf. Grant us to live in harmony. God's mercy prevail. Let us pray for the God of hope, joy, and peace to fill all hearts. One voice, glorify. God, prepare the way. God's mercy prevail. Amen. Good morning. The reading today is Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. The armor of God. Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the right readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. This is the word of the Lord. of each one of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our salvation. And may we, like Samuel, cry out and say, Speak, Lord, for we are listening. Amen. 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 So, the armor of God. I wonder sometimes what to wear. I wonder sometimes. It's, it's hard in a life that is so full. To, to know what exactly to wear. For instance, yesterday I was blessed to be able to participate in a veteran's ride from Claremont down to Keene, and we went on our motorcycles with some veterans of the Afghanistan War and the Vietnam War. And uh, being on a motorcycle, you, you have to dress in a certain way so that you're protected. You have to wear boots and jeans and a leather vest and a helmet. And then in the evening, I was blessed to participate in Ellen Mercer's granddaughter's wedding, a beautiful affair. You see some remnants here of the flowers. But this place was lovely last night. The people, the joy. And you dress a little differently for a wedding than you do for a motorcycle ride. So how was I to dress in the morning? I almost feel like I'm back when I was in fifth grade, you know, changing outfits every few minutes to do things. But you know what, in my house, if I take out this vest, and I get the shoes that I have, my sneakers of this same color, I have a little puppy dog who knows exactly what this means. That she is going for a walk or a run, and she gets very excited. So what we wear doesn't only protect us or make us comfortable, but it also conveys a message to those around us. I've said before that police officers have a certain look. Jim cultivates that look. I don't think he does it knowingly, but you know, when you see him or you see certain people 
like him. They just have this look, and you know that they're military or police officers or that sort of thing. And I think I told you before that I had this vision of sort of rural pastors, rural female pastors especially, of having sort of a corduroy jumper. I just sort of thought that was the, uh, the uniform. <laughs> and so I looked for a long time for a corduroy jumper, and I couldn't find one. But I realized it was a sense of personal style, not so much that being a uniform. You can tell who someone is by what they wear. You can tell what they stand for. And for the armor of God that Paul talks about when he's writing this letter to the people at Ephesus, to the church there, he's telling them to put on the armor of God, to put on that protection. He tells them to do that so that they can begin to fight a spiritual warfare. This was a great analogy for his time because there was so much war, so close, so nearby, so present in their everyday lives. It was a great metaphor. For us, there might be a different metaphor. For us, there might be something else that helps us to understand more clearly because we aren't engaged in war. But we do still have that history, that culture. We sing our, our songs like, Onward Christian Soldiers, and Soldiers of Christ Arise. And we think about that idea of the panoply, the, the, the armor of God. You know, panoply is an interesting word. It's, it's one that's always been really special to me. You'll see it here in one of the verses of our final hymn, Soldiers of Christ Arise, that was written by Charles Wesley. Um, panoply actually means the armor of God. But I was talking with a friend the other day. She happens to be uh, a physician in charge of the emergency room in one of the Boston hospitals. And we get together once a month with a group. And uh, we participate in what's called a Quaker Clearness Committee. And in this Clearness Committee, I don't know if you've ever done this as a kid, I used to say, Quaker's meeting has begun. No more laughter, no more fun. If you show your teeth your tongue, you will pay a forfeit. Have you ever recognized that? Do you know that at all? Um, and, and it was meant that we would be quiet. It was kind of a fun little thing. But it really has meaning. It has history in the Quaker tradition. It's, it's something that still goes on today. It's a, it's a gathering of people that promises to be in community with one another. They come together and they, they share times of discernment, times of sorting things out, times of listening carefully to what God has to say. So for instance, the focus person, the person who brings their situation to the committee might say, um, I'm contemplating a job change. What do you hear God saying in this to me? And the other people aren't meant to fix the problem or advise, but they're meant to listen to God. And so we bring to bear resources like scripture and wisdom that we've heard over the years and we share with one another. And it's a prayerful time, a time with deep silences. That's the no more talking, no more fun part. But this, this friend and I were having this conversation this week during the course of our clearness committee, and one of our other colleagues was the focus person and talking about her situation. And my friend used the word panoply. And I thought, did she use that wrong? Because the way she used it, it sounded like a bunch of stuff. You know, a group of things. Like, there's a panoply of trees over there, or a panoply of books over there. And I thought, that's not how I understand this quote at all. And you'll see in that last, that last hymn that we sing how it's used there. But for me, I told you before that I was raised in the Christian Science Church, and the founder of Christian Science, Mary Baker Eddy, used that term. And she said this, she said, clad in the panoply of love, human hatred cannot reach you. Glad, clothed, girded about with love, human hatred cannot reach you. So she was very specifically, and so is Wesley in this hymn, talking about armor, the armor of God, that which you are clothed with which protects you, clad in the panoply of love. So I looked it up, and it turns out that panoply, in my way, is an older definition and a more current definition is the one that says a lot of stuff. But you know where the intersection is, is that it's a whole bunch of armor. It's not just one suit of armor. It's all those pieces of armor. So all those things that Paul is telling us about in the scripture today, there are six of them. Six individual pieces of armor. And he talks about them for spiritual warfare. So he's not talking about a physical battle. He's talking about an opportunity for us to clothe ourselves with the things of God, to protect ourselves.
It's a spiritual thing. It's a deeply spiritual thing. You know, it's important, too, because we are called to spiritual warfare. We don't talk about it an awful lot, but we do talk about it when members join the church. In our United Methodist membership vows, we actually say that we renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of the world, and repent of our sin. We say that we accept freedom and power God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they may take. We are constantly praying for this world. And we don't frame it as if they're attacks all the time. We don't always use that language. We don't frame it as if we are at war. But they are attacks. And we are warring. And sometimes the enemy is systemic injustice. Sometimes it's things like poverty, where so many in this country are so wealthy, and yet there are people who sleep in doors, in doorways. There are people who are hungry. We're the wealthiest country. Why do we have hungry people? Why do we have people without health care? Those are systemic injustices that we are called to fight against. Now, we might not feel like we have opportunities to do that every day, and that's part of what my job is, is to stand up here and remind us that we are called to do that. And we find ways, we find ways through the Sarah Barton Fund to give diapers to the town welfare office so that they can be distributed to people in need. We find ways to give out the Thanksgiving baskets, the Christmas baskets, the gift cards that we give. We give backpacks to the needy. And still we're called to more. We are. We really are. And that's what I am here to remind us of. You might see at the end of the scripture today that Paul says all these wonderful things about the armor of God, and then he says, pray for me. Pray for me, an ambassador of this message, because it's hard. He was actually in chains at the time. It's a hard message to bring, this prophetic message of the Bible. In Matthew 25, it is delineated what we are actually called for. We are called to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to welcome the stranger. And somehow in society, this has become a political issue. And it makes me wonder, is this church infringing on state? Or is this state infringing on church when it's always been our responsibility to take care of? And so I would ask prayers as well, because it's difficult to preach a message like that when it might be perceived as political, which is not what I'm called to be here to do. I'm called to here to tell you what I hear God say through the Bible to help us discern together what we are being called to do and how we are being called to do it. So I invite your prayers for the leaders of churches everywhere so that those messages might not get caught in that place where we wonder whether is this political speech or is this what we're really being asked to do. And it's a hard message, too. It's a message that we don't always follow. Boy, I know that's true for me. It's hard sometimes to do all that I believe God is calling you to. <coughs> but I welcome the opportunity. And I welcome the opportunity to continue to think about how I can fulfill all that God has called me to do through my membership vows in the church. So more than anything, throughout this work, you need to protect your soul. You need to protect your soul or else you will be overwhelmed. We're not fighting against human enemies here. We're talking about the spiritual forces of evil, the forces of wickedness. And we wonder, what is that? Why is there bad in this world? In theological terms, that's called theodicy. Why do bad things happen to good people? <coughs> Why? When God is good, if God is all love and all powerful, why do bad things happen? And it's something that all of us continue to pray about and continue to develop our understanding about across the world, across time. We say, who is my enemy? Who is that spiritual force of wickedness? It's not a person. And sometimes it's as much inside us as it is outside. Sometimes it's that doubt in us that can't quite understand, that wonders whether this message is from God or whether this message is not of God. We, we, we begin to doubt ourselves. We begin to wonder whether we're weary, worthy. And we, 
we need that protection around us. And the way to bring that protection is to participate in those spiritual disciplines that strengthen these things, like truth and righteousness and peace, and our understanding of salvation and the Word of God. What's important is to be different. Not to take up weapons, but to take up prayer and those things that it means to be a Christian. Things like studying scriptures, things like being in Christian community, like I was describing my friends and I do for our clearness committees. In that way, we are clad in that panoply of love where human hatred cannot reach us. And we're able to take on those pieces of armor. Let me remind you what those are. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. If Paul writing today, he might use different illustrations. The ones that are closer to our experience. But as a preacher of his own time, he talks of the survival equipment in terms that his contemporaries would understand. He uses a picture of the first century's quintessential survivor, the Roman centurion. And he suggests the way that he is outfitted as a metaphor for our Christian survival. He calls it the armor of God. So first he talks about the belt of peace, of truth, rather. And what's really neat about this for me is that in the King James Version, it calls it the girdle of truth, right? So I love that idea of the girdle of truth because it holds all of that truth in. It holds us together. It's the thing that, that keeps us together. We expect others to be truthful with us. We try to be truthful to the world. We expect that there's somebody out there, somebody's monitoring things so that we're getting true information. And then we get perplexed when they say coffee's good for you one week and the next week it's bad. We think, well, where's the truth? I, I just want, you know, the re something to rely on. And in the Bible, it does say God is truth with a capital T. The truth that we can rely on. And the things that hold our relationships together, that hold us together with those that we are in relationship with as well as with God is truth. So that idea of the belt of truth, the girdle of truth, is so important. And after we put on that belt of truth, we must put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now the breastplate, you know, covers your torso, your most tender organs, your most delicate parts, and the most vital organ of the body, the heart. Now your heart is the real battlefield. In the Bible, the heart represents the will, the emotions, the mind. It is the essence of what we are. Your eternal destiny will be determined by your heart, as it says in Romans 10. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. If you believe these things in your heart, if you protect them, with your understanding that is cultivated through your reading of scripture and your prayer, you shall be saved. You shall be saved. How you think, how you act, the person you are, or you will soon become, is always determined by your heart. Psalm 23 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. The forces of wickedness come to your heart and try to tempt you to sin. And the moment you feel tempted, you feel condemned because you were tempted. These forces love to remind us of our sins. They love to bring them up to our attention, and they love to dig up old dirt and throw it in our face. They love to rattle the skeletons in our closet, and they do that until we become doubting Christians, and then depressed Christians, and finally defeated Christians, and thereby win the war. That is why it is so important that you put on the breastplate of righteousness. Because when you do that, you can distinguish between the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the accusation of evil. The Holy Spirit will use the scripture to convict us. Evil will use feelings to condemn us. When the Spirit convicts us, it is to draw us closer to God. But when evil condemns us, it is to drive us away. And then there are the shoes of the gospel of peace. 
There's something paradoxical in presenting the warrior in the midst of battle equipped with peace. Paul knows that to establish peace of God in the universe, which is our ultimate aim after all, we must do battle against the spiritual evil which disturbs the peace. Perhaps the reason Paul uses the metaphor of shoes is that peace is something that we cannot hope to convey by spitting things out. We have to get in there. We have to be active. And it's not what happens to you in life that's important. It's how you react to what happens that really matters to God. If you're at peace with God, you can withstore any storm. The Bible says in Isaiah 26, God will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is fixed on him. I read about an elderly lady who was living in an apartment building during the Second World War in London, and the Germans came and they bombed all around, all night long. And when they began to search among the blown up buildings and ruins for the dead and the missing, lo and behold, they came upon this grandmother sound asleep in her bedroom. Somebody said to her, how in the world could you sleep with all that bombing going on? She said, well, it says in the Bible, he that keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. So I figured there wasn't any reason for both of us to stay awake. Now her feet were shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, that she might find peace in the midst of that. And then there's the shield of faith. To properly translate here, we should probably read faithfulness. The Greek word is the same. And remembering that we are talking about God's armor, so to speak of God's faith, would not make sense. The Bible is full of stories of God's faithfulness. There is that wonderful parable in the Old Testament in the book of Hosea. The prophet was instructed to take himself a wife, not some sweet young thing, but a prostitute named Gomer. She ran off after the wedding, and he went after her. He gave her presents. She ran off again. He went after her again. She bore three children, presumably not Hosea's, but none of that mattered. Hosea never gave up on Gomer. The message of that book that bears the prophet's name is that God never gives up on us. No matter how low we go, no matter how unfaithful we are, for those in the midst of a struggle for survival, it is comforting to know that our God will never desert us, will always stand by us, will never let us down. Next, Paul talks about the helmet of salvation. Now, salvation doesn't mean some pie in the sky by and by. Salvation means health, wholeness, something similar to the Hebrew word shalom. <coughs> salvation is a description of life the way God meant life to be lived. The reason Paul called salvation a helmet is because a helmet offers protection for the head. Too often, Christian people fail to act or don't act because they think they know what God wants. Sometimes we even misidentify the enemy, and that always results in disaster. We need God's protection on our heads if we are ultimately to survive. And the final piece of equipment is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, it has been noted that of all the equipment for these Christian soldiers, this is the only one that could be considered a source of offense. The phrase might be better understood by looking at another passage where God's word is compared to a sword. In Hebrews 4, it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. This is hardly an offensive attack. It's exploratory surgery. If Paul had written this in the 21st century, he might have called God's word not the sword, but the scalpel of the spirit. Now Paul gives that one final instruction. He says, pray. Pray at all times. Pray for one another. Pray for yourselves, pray for your leaders. There's a wonderful reminder here that we are not lone rangers. We are members of a tribe, that vast company of saints through the ages known as the Church of Jesus Christ. We are not alone. So it's time to get up and be clothed with this armor of God. In your bulletin, you'll notice that there's a little bit of a new format. I hope that the inside is 
nice and, and reminds you of the old format so that it's large print and that sort of thing. But there's a place in there that I have a section for inspiration, and I've retold this story. The shoes of the gospel of peace interest me. My son has autism and doesn't speak, so much of the communication in our house is nonverbal. When my wife and I come home and come down each morning, the first thing my son does is check our shoes. He's learned that the shoes we have on speak volumes about the kind of day we have planned. Dress shoes mean work, scuffed slip-ons mean a casual, more relaxed day around the house. The way we dress denotes to those around us who we are, whose we are, what we represent. The shoes we wear carry us out into the world, not only in a way of peace, but the gospel of peace, bringing the good news to everyone who needs to hear it. And we need to remember that this is a defensive rather than an offensive. It's not used to attack. The gospel is the, the middle of this whole scripture. The truth, the righteousness, the peace, the faith, the salvation, the word of God that we are invited to take on in this armor of God, we are invited to take wherever we go. And when we are well practiced in those spiritual disciplines, it will come so naturally to us. I invite you to put on that armor of God to strengthen you and to prepare you for all the world throws at you. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. Amen. Amen. The target of response is honored Christian soldiers.
now it's time for us to share our concerns and our celebrations, our gratitude, our affirmation, our lamentations. In the Grantham Church, one of our new members is a former Air Force chaplain. And he shared today his memories of John McCain. And I just wanted to, to say a word about how, what a wonderful man of great integrity and how grateful I am that he has been a leader in our country. And so I will with prayers for the family of John McCain and for our whole country that's been born this loss. This is my prayer. This is our prayer. Also, before I get to Curly, I wanted to express gratitude for our sound system. Because in order to have a comfortable wedding with a very full church yesterday, we had to have a lot of fans on. And so because we had our, our um, new sound system, I think people were able to hear very clearly. We used every element. People who were reading poetry to the microphone that Curly will bring around, where people were able to hear the vows, and it was quite wonderful. So I express my gratitude for the church's vision in purchasing the sound system. This is my piece of gratitude. This, this is our gratitude. gratitude. Now, Curly. Keep the world in your thoughts. It's still a little bit a lot of tension out there. And now, since the, the hurricane gone out a little way from Hawaii, the Boston first wrote to the people of Hawaii um, as they clean up after this. And there is one more thing, and I know this is not really fair, but my mother is celebrating my uh, her birthday tomorrow. <laughs> Go for it right there. And her name's Ham. that we have our daughter Jean until Tuesday. <laughs> Jean is uh, very active in, in Massachusetts with thrift shops and in the Episcopal Church and uh, we feel blessed and thank God that she's here with us today. This is my prayer. This, this is our prayer. I just wanted to add is this mine? Yes, it is. I just wanted to add to what you said about John McCain. I don't know if anyone was able to see that hour-long special about him, but it was quite moving, and uh, he was certainly a man of faith and of word. And I uh, just wanted to reiterate how moved I was by that and by his own. Uh, I'd like prayers for Sherry, who this week will find out, next this coming week, where her cancer is, how it has uh, affected her brain, whatever. So just prayers that she will get good results. Thank you. This is my prayer. This is Cesar.
super eggs plus bicycle thing and the hospital day thing, all of that. So I thank her for all of that. And me, she's learned, I'm learning a lot from her, even for communion when I'm not here at <laughs> coffee house. And a lot of things that she's taught me since I've been here and she's been here. And I, I praise her. I might even do both. And I am back on track, I hope, with no more work issues with my mouth. And I'm eating, back to eating food that I'm enjoying. I'm eating leftovers right now out of my refrigerator before I come up to Sydney. So I hope there is an end. And I was made my up for playing this in the morning for church. She's going to take them to get a thing off for a day or so, I hope. We'll look. Thank you. 
kindness in the midst of words that are on. Help us to be your love in this world. The love that you sent through your Son, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the highest is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory.
bring these gifts of love and place them upon your altar and invoke your blessings upon them, that you may do through them and through us your will in this world. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our final <coughs> hymn this morning is one by John, by Charles Wesley. Soldiers of Christ arise. Gracias. 